Yeah, yeah. Today, we're getting into the top 42 running back rankings. 2024 fantasy football, half PPR, adjust accordingly. In the draft guide, we will have standard half and full PPR for y'all, every position. We came pre-tucked, okay? Because we want to get rolling here. And the best way to get rolling is to move past Christian McCaffrey, who is the running back one. He is the 101. He is in a tier by himself. So let's just push past that, all right? Tier two. We have Bijan and Brees Hall. I have Bijan above Brees Hall. I just feel like there are fewer question marks with Bijan going into this year. The new offense, a great offensive line. Uh, yes, there is a little bit of fragility. Both of these guys have quarterback coming off Achilles tears. So I guess they're kind of in the same spot. The one thing that I would say as it pertains to Brees Hall is I'm not sure. While, while both of them are crazy good at pass catching, both of them are great on all three downs. I don't think we're going to see as big of a target share going to the running backs in this offense as we did last year with, you know, the dump off queen, Zach Wilson. So I think I am less concerned with everything around B. John Robinson as I am with the Jets. And again, you know, I want to say like, I want to make fun of the Jets and be like, it's the Jets. Of course, something's going to go wrong, but it's like, it's the Falcons. Of course, of course, something is going to go wrong. But this is just whatever your taste, whatever uh, floats your boat, whatever kind of cocktail you like to stir up. Bijan, Brees Hall, I don't think either of them are going to lose your leagues. I think coming into next year, wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if either of them are the 101 of all fantasy football, okay? So that's just the way I'm looking at it. I think Bijan's going to explode where Raheem Morris coming in, the great offensive line, Kirk Cousins stabilizing the offense. That's not a word, but we're making it up because Bijan Robinson is going to make up a lot of fantasy points for your team. Let's move on to Tier 3. We have Jonathan Taylor. We have Jameer Gibbs. We have Saquon Barkley. Now, with JT... He signed the extension last year. Anthony Richardson will be back under center. They have a surprisingly good offensive line. They kind of fell off for a minute, but they picked up some uh, later round dudes that ended up panning out for them really, really well. They got rid of Zach Moss, so there's not really any competition for touches. The The one concern that kind of keeps him out of that tier is does he catch passes because he's running behind a mobile quarterback, obviously, with Anthony Richardson, and they tend to dump the ball off less. And then on the goal line, what happens? Does Anthony Richardson end up scoring 12 rushing touchdowns this year, which will obviously take a little bit of food off of Jonathan Taylor's plate. But he's got upside for days in a very fast-paced offense, a high-play offense under Stane Shikin, and uh, just a, a division that they're probably going to have to score a lot of points in. So I got no problem with JT. Jameer Gibbs was dynamite as a rookie, missed some time, and still ended up with a shitload of yards, a shitload of touchdowns. This should be one of, if not the best teams in the NFL. He's behind one of, if not probably the best offensive line in the NFL. I'll tell you why I have him down at five when we get to David Montgomery, and I want to talk a little bit more about David Montgomery when we get there and what I'm expecting from him. Saquon is my number six. He's in this tier. These are all very high upside guys, very explosive, very good athlete dudes. Saquon, my concern is one, I don't think he's as explosive as he was as a rookie when he came into the league back in 2018. I don't think he breaks off those long runs anymore. I also question whether or not Jalen Hurts is going to dump the ball off to running backs. I question whether or not Saquon Barkley is going to get any rushing scores on the goal line because of the tush push. So a lot of the same concerns I have for JT, I have for Saquon Barkley. But regardless, they're all fine, high-end, mid RB1s. We move to tier four. It gets a little bit shakier. We have Kyron at seven. We've got Derrick Henry at eight. I have Isaiah Pacheco. I just made this move this morning. These are obviously updated rankings as of you know late July. Got Devon Achan at 10, and I've got Travis Etienne at 11. These are dudes who could for sure unquestionably be the workhorses there, but it's a little bit tough to understand if there's going to be another player that factors into their workload. Uh, you don't expect Blake Corham to sit the bench the whole year. I think Kyron Williams is good enough uh, and this offense is good enough to dominate in even a smaller touch size than he had last year. Everyone's concerned that he's not going to have 95% of the touches because Blake Corham is there. I went back, looked at last year's games. Uh, there were four games in which Kyron Williams had fewer than 80% of the Rams snaps at the running back position last year. Four games, okay? Game number one, 25 carries, 103 yards, two touchdowns, three catches, 24 yards. Game two, 16 carries, 143 yards, six catches, 61 yards, another two touchdowns. Game three, week 15, 27 carries, 152 yards, a touchdown, five catches, three yards. Game four, 22 carries, 104 yards, and a touchdown. These are all games with fewer than 80% of the snaps for the Rams. So Kyron Williams has proven that he can do a lot with a little, and I'm not making fun of his size. I'm making fun of his workload. I'm making fun of you for fading him 
because of what you think his workload is going to be. This Rams offense exploded out of nowhere, and they put together a top five run blocking offensive line. All right. I'm in on Kyron. I'm in on Henry here, too. I think the math just maths. Okay. Gus Edwards, a far inferior running back, just scored 13 touchdowns and led the NFL in goal line carries. This is now Derrick Henry's role. Will they have a pass catching back? Did he lose some steam? Is he is he losing to father time? Maybe. I, I think he'll be fine. Pacheco, you know I love him. A great role. Maybe they use a third down back. Maybe they use a pass catching back. But the offensive line is great. The offensive upside is great. The Chiefs are great. Pacheco is great. He can catch passes. He dominated. He went workhorse. Bell cow. Over 21 PPR fantasy points per game in the games when McKinnon was out last year. And McKinnon is gone permanently this year. We love Pacheco. We love Achan. He's just lightning in a bottle. Obviously, he was uh, incredible in the games that he did play. Mostert is still there, though, so that does make me a little bit concerned. They also lost some pieces on the offensive line, so I don't know how dominant they're going to be running the ball. Obviously, the scheme is incredible, but they lose uh, their two best run blocking linemen in Robert Hunt and Connor Williams this offseason. Not to mention that their defense is probably going to be kind of bad because we don't know when any of their pass rushers are going to be playing. Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb and a lot of those guys are supposedly not going to be ready for week one. So if their defense is staying on the field for a long period of time, obviously less touches for the offense overall. I'm a little bit worried about just like the overall makeup of Miami. They'll put together firework weeks, obviously, but there are some red flags with HN, obviously outside of just him being small and you think he's going to get hurt. ETN, I should probably have him higher. I just like, I don't know. I, I, I just don't see him getting 280 carries. I just... I, 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 for some reason, maybe I'm just bored of him. Maybe he deserves to be a little bit higher. Maybe these other guys are just a little bit more exciting, and that's why I have him higher. Like, he finished very highly last year, and he did great. Uh, I I just, like, eventually they have to get another running back involved. Tank Bigsby is obviously not him. They brought on Kieran Robinson, the Texas pass catching running back, but apparently most of the reports are saying that he is there just to play some special team stuff. So ETN, again, he's in tier four. He is with the Kyron Williams is in the Derrick Henry. I just have him below the rest of them, but I'd be happy uh, with ETN if I did end up drafting him on my team. And a lot of the underdog drafts I've been doing lately, I've been able to get ETN's really dropped significantly. People are really bored of ETN. I've gotten him in the fourth round in multiple drafts over the last week or so. And if you're not drafting on underdog fantasy, it is the single best way to prepare you for your actual fantasy leagues. The ADP is a little bit skewed. Wide receivers go very heavy, but it helps you stay on top of the movement and the trends and where players are going within their positional rankings group. So by the time you hit your draft with your friends and family, like you dominate that shit. And the other way to dominate it is by copying our draft guide, which has all of our rankings in there. And if you go and deposit on Underdog Fantasy right now, underdogfantasy.com, or the app, which you can download, link in the description. You deposit $10 or more using our code BDGE. Not only can you get up to $250 in bonus bets and bonus cash on the app, but you get our draft guide absolutely free when it goes live on August 1st. It is the best deal in the industry. The draft guide is going to blow you away this year. All right, so if you want our rankings, you just want to hear me stop yapping that is the way to do it. Underdog Fantasy code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more. Let's move on to tier five. These are these are good backs. These are very good backs that I kind of question just the overall upside if they can get to everyone up to this point, all 11 running backs I think I've named, I think can get to top five status. I think can get to maybe top three status. I think have a chance to be the number one or two overall fantasy running back. I question that with everybody else left on this list. So we have a very large tier here of James Cook, Rashad White, Josh Jacobs, Joe Mixon, David Montgomery, Alvin Kamara, Kenneth Walker, Najee Harris, James Conner, and Aaron Jones. So that is 12 down to 21. James Cook, I think with Diggs and Gabriel Davis out, we should see that offense start to lean more on James Cook in the passing game. So if you're in a full PPR league, I think there's a chance that James Cook catches 70 to 80 passes this year and becomes a massive part of the overall game plan, right? He got a shitload of carries last year. The touchdown concerns are super warranted because Josh Allen's on the goal line. They brought in Ray Davis, who's a bigger back, and maybe they use him a little bit on the goal line. So I wouldn't really project James Cook for more than like five or six touchdowns. But again, full PPR, I think there's a chance that he goes and surpasses 65, 70, 75 receptions this year because their offense is going to need to spark something in the passing game with the loss of Diggs and Gabriel Davis. Rashad White, I just think he's a super high floor player. Uh, all they did was bring in Bucky Irving, who's 190 pounds and also specializes in pass catching, but that's kind of the only thing that Rashad White has been good at. We move to Josh 
Jacobs. Josh Jacobs goes to Green Bay. He signs there, a nice little lucrative deal. But they do bring in Marshawn Lloyd, and I think they're going to use Marshawn Lloyd in a more explosive third down, two and four minute drill role uh, at a higher pace than people are expecting. So Jacobs coming off of his worst year as a pro uh, efficiency wise, Green Bay's run blocking lines also not that great. So I question if Josh Jacobs can really get it done on his own. I still think, you know, he's running by 14, so he's not very far off the the RB1's list. I think he's got a a really solid floor. I think he could end up getting, you know, 8, 9, 10 rushing touchdowns because of the offense elevating him. And I think the same with the next couple guys. We have Joe Mixon and we have David Montgomery. Now, Joe Mixon, I tweeted this out earlier today. If you're not following me on Twitter, you should go do so at Nick Ercolano. Uh, Mixon's outlook in Houston is almost identical to what it's been in Cincinnati. The Texans offense keeps his goal line volume high, and that's what matters for his fantasy season. Last year, Houston and Cincinnati both gave their running backs the exact same number of goal line carries. So the groups of running backs on both respective teams had 21 goal line carries. In Cincinnati, Mixon saw 21 goal line carries. Houston split it up between Singletary, Damian Pierce, Andrew Beck, their fullback. So I think Mixon's role is very secure. That is the role he's going to have, and that is what keeps his floor so high. Now, Stroud, like a lot of the good quarterbacks in the NFL, are gunslingers. They don't typically check down to running backs. So I don't think Mixon has a very high ceiling, especially in PPR leagues. But like Jacobs, he could rumble into, you know, 9, 10, 12 touchdowns if things break right for him. Now, David Montgomery, another tweet that I ripped off this morning. Last year, David Montgomery had arguably his best season as a professional player setting career highs in touchdowns with 13, yards per carry 4.6, while facing the sixth highest average number of defenders in the box. So they knew when David Montgomery came onto the field, they were running the ball. And they should have because David Montgomery was kind of phased out of the passing game. But here's the point I would make with Montgomery, right? Even when Gibbs was more involved down the stretch, Montgomery scored something like eight touchdowns in their final eight games, okay? It wasn't like he was actually phased out of the offense. It was more like they, they were able to get Gibbs more involved while Montgomery stayed plenty involved. And when I look at this Detroit team, here's the difference between 2023 Detroit and 2024. They were letting up like 25 points a game as a defense. They were constantly in shootout mode, which obviously favors a guy like Jameer Gibbs. This offseason, however, they went out and signed DJ Reader. They now have two top 10 interior run defensive linemen on that line, plus Aiden Hutchinson. So they bring in DJ Reader. They draft Terrian Arnold and Ennis Rakestraw Jr. with their first two picks, their first and second round pick. They bring in Carlton Davis. This defense, they have Brian Branch back and coming into his second year. This defense is going to be leaps and bounds better than it was last year. They are going to they are going from a bad defense to a legitimately good defense with a lot of playmakers. And again, they're just going to be mauling teams. And you have Dan Campbell, who is a very hard-nosed type of coach that loves keeping a dude like David Montgomery on the field. David Montgomery is not Jamal Williams. David Montgomery is a very talented back that can play all three downs, and he's going to be continued to use on the goal line. All right, This is a team that's going to be great. They're going to score a fuckload of points. And because their defense is a lot better, they're going to play some ground and pound. They're going to play like, let's run the clock. Let's use our bully ball, David Montgomery, in the backfield to fuck some shit up. Okay, So David Montgomery, I feel as good about him as anyone on this list so far to be scoring double-digit touchdowns going into the year. We have Alvin Kamara, who should get a million checkdowns again as well. I'm not really concerned about Kendra Miller. There's been nothing positive out of camp. Kenneth Walker is one that I really haven't decided on. He's like such an explosive playmaker. He dealt with some injuries last year. I think Zach Charbonnet is not not great. He, he didn't look great last year, even when he got his chances. And if Walker is fully healthy, I think in a spread type of offense, like they're bringing in with the new OC, running a lot of three wide receiver sets, maybe the O-line should be a little bit more open. They dealt with a lot of offensive line injuries last year to start off. Uh, so I think things got a little bit messy pretty quickly. Walker's pass catching upside, you have to question a little bit, but he's just such an explosive athlete that you can't really rank him much further down than RB18. So you've got Najee Harris up next. He's gone for over 1,000 yards in all three seasons. He's gone for at least eight touchdowns in all three seasons. They've now drafted offensive linemen in the first round in back-to-back years. They got Russell Wilson under center, who will give them a little bit more stability. Najee's been great down the stretch in both years so far. He will be the goal line back. I also think with the departure of Deontay Johnson, there's going to be a ton of targets available, and I think a lot of them are going to go to the running backs in Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. So I think both of them will do well this year. I just prefer Najee because I think the touchdown floor is very, very high for him. Same goes with James Conner, right? We're excited about Arizona. We're excited about Kyler and McBride and Marvin Harrison Jr. 
Like, James Conner rarely plays with good offenses in Arizona, and when he does, he'll probably eat, and he's coming off of his most efficient year. Everything out of camp so far has been like, hold the horses on Trey Benson. We know you like him. He's a day-two pick. He's explosive, but this is James Conner's role until proven otherwise. And again, he played great last year, so he should be the goal line back. He's an underrated pass catching back. James Conner, I've I've come to grips with he should with him being a top 20 back. Rounding out tier five is Aaron Jones. I really don't know what to make of uh, of Aaron Jones. I can't really get a strong read on what I want to do with him here. I'm not reaching for him. I'm I'm worried about this offense and like how successful a run game can be. But he also did finish last year with five straight games of over 100 yards like he was as good as he's ever been down the stretch last year this is more of a situation hesitation than it really is Aaron Jones although he's getting older too so I am I can't really say I'm optimistic about Aaron Jones right now I just like if he falls to me at good value I'll take him but I'm not necessarily reaching for him we move into tier six and I just want to say I'm going to be doing the same exact video for wide receivers tomorrow so if you're not subscribed to the channel if you don't have notifications turned on just take a minute pause everybody breathe everybody tuck their shirts in everybody settle down go subscribe go hit the notification button so tomorrow you can hear me yap about the receivers as well tier six raheem mostert at running back 22 ramondre at 23 zach moss at 24 deandre swift at 25 pollard at 26 zamir white at 27 i think i probably need to move zach moss down a little bit this is where i start to get a little bit of the ick here. Raheem Mostert, I feel good about, right? I feel good about his role. However, he's played for a very long time, and uh, the very large majority of the seasons that this man has played, he has not played a full season. He's coming off of like a, you know, an all all world season, so it's very easy to get caught up in what he just did. But bringing back to the point I made with A Chan, they also lost their two best run blocking linemen. So how does that affect Raheem Mostert? He is. 32 years old. He is one of the most fragile players in the entire NFL. He has a crazy explosive sophomore, Devon A. Chan, on his heels, vying for more red zone touches, vying for more work overall. So, like, Raheem Mostert is, on paper, should be great again. I just think there are some some scary things that kind of attach themselves to uh, to him that are that are obvious red flags. Same thing with, I mean, all these guys have obvious red flags. Right? Mandre catches the extension, but this offense for New England while should be 100 times better than last year still not one that will be you know top top half the league in scoring uh Ramondre is also now battling Antonio Gibson for pass catching work Gibson is a cone on the ground right I want nothing new with Gibson but Gibson will be a third down back Gibson will catch passes all right it'll be enough that Stevenson's ceiling will be completely kind of like shifted downward all right so Stevenson I still have him as RB 23 so he's still an RB 2 for me but like I can't make the case for him to be any higher now Zach Moss takes over that Joe Mixon role where as I said Mixon had 21 fucking goal line carries last year which is an insane amount okay and I assume Zach Moss is going to have that role given they let Mixon walk and then they just signed him they have Chase Brown who's more of like a third down electric type of back so I think Zach Moss will be in a good offense he'll be the goal line back uh, I think we are probably weighing a little bit too much on the fact that we saw him be good for like a five game sample in Indy, but we have about a three or four year sample in Buffalo where he wasn't that good. So I, I think we probably need to cool it a little bit there. Same thing with DeAndre Swift. I, I think he's got upside just because he's an athlete and he is a uh, he's shown that he can put together good seasons, i.e. last year in Philly. My problem with Swift and Chicago is, one, their offensive line is bad. Two, they have Khalil Herbert, who's been a very good runner. They have Roshan Johnson, who can pass block. Um, we don't know who's going to be the goal line back there. Caleb Williams, sneaky, has averaged about 100 carries a season in college, which is fewer games than the NFL plays. So he is a mobile back who's going to take carries. Uh, mobile backs typically don't dump the ball to the running backs. We saw that last year at USC. He didn't throw the ball to the running backs. I, I don't know why you would dump off the running backs very often in an offense that has Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, Roma Dunze, and Cole Komet. So Swift, I think the upside is theoretically there more than uh, we will actually see it play out. Now, there's typically a, a big gap in drafts where Tony Pollard goes. He goes in like the ninth round. And I've kind of been on record recently saying that I think he is becoming one of the better values in all of fantasy drafts because they just signed him to a pretty lucrative deal. I think it was three for 22 or three for 25, maybe. And he's going to be the starting running back there. Tajay Spears is good, but I think Tony Pollard will be the workhorse. And I think just the way that this offense is going to function, right? Brian Callahan is coming over from Cincinnati. He was their OC and he is now the head coach for Tennessee. They ran a shitload of three wide receiver sets. And I think 
This is going to be a spread offense. They're going to pass the ball a lot. This will be a much improved offensive line. Like the Steelers, they've gone back-to-back years with first-round offensive linemen draft picks. So we loved Tony Pollard two years ago, and he had a bad year last year, and now he's dropping so significantly far in an offense where maybe they go with like a, a mix and geo split, a mix and Samaj P. Ryan split that we saw in Cincinnati where Brian Callahan came from, where Tony Pollard might see the majority of goal line carries or see all the goal line carries. And, you know, Mixon could still catch 35, 40, 45, 50 passes in a year. That's what he did. Pollard could absolutely do that. That is the type of offense they're going to run there. So I think we're starting to underrate Tony Pollard for sure in that Tennessee offense. Zamir White, I go back and forth with him as well. He's my 27th ranked running back, and he and he wraps up the tier six here. Zamir White's a fucking animal, but I am extremely worried about the offense there. Like, I think they project to be a bottom eight offense in the league, most likely. I think they project to be a defense first team that does not run a lot of plays that is very slow pace like Antonio Pierce ran a very slow offense last year and I think we're going to be in trouble if we are trying to you know extrapolate a four game sample size into a full season especially for a guy where if they're trailing Zamir White does not play a lot Zamir White last year even in those games where he was you know the workhorse on third downs Amir Abdullah out snapped him 51 to 11 okay so When they're in pass catching mode, when they are down, when they are trailing, when they need to catch up, which will probably be a decent amount of time, Zamir White's not going to be on the field, okay? So unless you're projecting him to be this huge explosive runner that scores from far out or this offense is a lot better than we're expecting and he gets a lot of goal line carries, I would – I'm a little bit hesitant on on Zamir White. I'll probably let somebody else draft him. We move down to Tier 7. Tier 7's kind of lit. Tier 7, they got some gas behind him. You know, it's funny because, like, Tier 6 is dudes that I don't like but I know are probably better than tier seven tier seven is all dudes that are like have a worse outlook or situation, but I like every one of these players, I think more than tier six. So starting at running back 28, we have Jalen Warren, Zeke, Brian Robinson, Jerome Ford, and Tajay Spears. Warren, of course, cemented himself last year in that Steelers offense, had 225, 230 opportunities. Arthur Smith is coming over. The one thing that is starting to scare me a little bit that we're hearing a lot of noise about in the Steelers' backfield is Arthur Smith comes over from Atlanta. He brings Cordell Patterson with him. Now, Cordell Patterson might just be brought over because of the new kickoff and kick return rules, and they're going to be utilizing him heavily there. However, Arthur Smith was there for the last three years in Atlanta with Cordell Patterson during his good years. So, even if Cordy P is not necessarily involved heavily, like if he starts to take, you know, 12 to 15 percent of the snaps in that backfield, if he starts to be the two and four minute drill back, if he starts to, you know, if he gets five carries a game, scores three touchdowns over the entire year, you know, sees 35, 40 targets, that is that is like enough of a, of a skim off the statistics where that's a that's a big changing uh, of where these guys will finish so I'm going to keep a very close eye on what's going on in the backfield for the Steelers throughout the offseason and that is something that I do in the draft guide one of the best parts I think of the draft guide is the preseason game write-ups and recaps I do a recap of every single game throughout the preseason to let y'all know who is running the snaps with the starters when the ones are on the field during the preseason games who is getting the third down snaps who's getting the two and four minute drill snaps who is on the field for those clutch situations situations do that in the draft guide all right so bdge.co is where you can get the draft guide or cheapest way to get it underdog fantasy promo code bdge so i've got Jalen warren i still think he's uh, uh, electric he could break away he can catch a lot of passes but arthur smith he's freaky we move on to zeke i've talked ad nauseum about zeke already i just like this backfield is just ripe for statistics this was the number one scoring offense in the league last year in dallas they let tony pollard walk they only brought in zeke he's competing with rico dowdle malik davis deuce vaughn for touches he will be the goal line back this is a team that is on the goal line very often so I think Zeke could be this year's Gus Edwards, dare I say, Raheem Mostert, all right? He is the easiest pick in double-digit rounds of fantasy drafts. Brian Robinson, I think he's kind of the forgotten man. Obviously, Eckler comes in, so he's going to take a lot of pass-catching work. But Brian Robinson's a good pass-catcher in his own right. Uh, Average 10.2 yards per reception, number one in the NFL last year. Was a good pass-catcher at Alabama. Will likely be, not likely, he will fucking for sure be the goal line back if Austin Eckler is his only competition. So B-Rob, I think, is a sneaky good value as your RB3. Jerome Ford, love his ass too. I am of the thought process. As you will see, he is not on my top 42 running back ranked players. Nick Chubb, 
I don't think we're going to see a lot of Nick Chubb this year. I don't think we're going to see a lot of successful Nick Chubb if we do see a lot of Nick Chubb this year. So I think it's Jerome Ford's backfield for the time being. I don't think it's Tajay Spears' backfield, but I think he's going to be a good player nonetheless. So Tajay Spears proved that he is explosive, proved that he's a very good pass catcher. I just don't think he's going to get a lot of goal line work, and I think he's going to be the 1B to Tony Pollard's 1A. Could we look back at the end of the year and he became the 1A? I think so. I think more likely what we'll see is one of those situations where by the end of it, like we were begging for Tony Pollard to become the guy over Zeke. Maybe that's what happens with Tajay Spears. I still think they pay Tony Pollard. I think they're going to use him as the one there. Uh, Tajay Spears will be a guy that can give you good weeks. I don't know how consistently it's going to happen without the touchdown upside. Tier eight and the final 10 guys here. We won't really go into depth on any of them because none of them are that exciting to me. Gus Edwards, at 33, Devin Singletary, Chase Brown, Austin Eckler, Javante Williams, Marshawn Lloyd, Trey Benson, Blake Corm, Rico Dowdle, Chuba Hubbard. So Gus is the starter for LA. I I yeah, I couldn't I couldn't really be more off of whoever the running back there in LA is right now because they don't have anyone that I feel confident with can stay healthy for a full year or be efficient with a big workload. I think there's a possibility we are underrating Devin Singletary, who just got a little bit of a bag from New York, and really the only competition he has behind him are multiple like day three Tyrone Tracy's and Eric Gray. And I like Tyrone Tracy; he's a cool back, but like they don't really have anything back there. So Devin Singletary might get fed. Chase Brown, he's a he's a high upside backup to Zach Moss right now. I think he can develop into a bigger role, but not necessarily sold on him as a player. The vibes out of Denver for Javante Williams have been horrific horrific for this man okay i'm still gonna draft him if he drops really far but like he just continues to to take a roller coaster straight downhill king the ka style marshall lloyd trey benson blake quorum i think those are three exciting rookies i think they are more hopeful thinking than really being like a huge piece of your fantasy lineup this year obviously they are fantastic handcuffs if i had to rank them in terms of handcuffs it would actually probably be the reverse order if I'm drafting Kyron Williams in the second round, I am making sure I get Blake Corum as a handcuff. Uh, if I draft James Conner or Josh Jacobs, the, the difference being you are investing less capital in those guys, right? You're getting James Conner in like the sixth or seventh round. So getting a handcuff there is like, it's weird. You want to handcuff guys that you spent a lot of uh, draft capital on. You don't necessarily need to do that if you're wasting, you know, two picks within three rounds on the same backfield. So I'm less likely to handcuff those guys, I think Marshawn Lloyd has a decent chance to be a standalone value by the end of the year. I hope Trey Benson can get on the field, but I don't feel confident in that outside of a James Conner injury. Rico Dowdle is my 41. I've also been saying, and I agree with what Hayden Winks tweeted last week. I think if you can't get Zeke, I'm fine with Rico Dowdle as a consolation prize. I think you should be leaving every single fantasy football draft you have with someone from the Dallas backfield, either Zeke or Rico Dowdle. And then I've got Chuba. Again, like I'm not confident that Nick Chubb's going to be healthy to start the year. I'm not confident that Jonathan Brooks is going to be healthy to start the year. There's no rush for him. He's 20 years old, ACL tear. Like they're not going to be good. They don't need him. I, I don't see a reason why they would rush him. And if they don't, it's Chuba Hubbard's backfield. They 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 put Miles Sanders into the fucking uh, the nether realm. What's the, the thing from Stranger Things or the movie Get Out? Like whatever those fucking space areas are, that's where Miles Sanders went. I'd be surprised if he uh, he'll make the team because they they have to pay him. But Chuba Hubbard's the guy in that backfield. So, uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. That oh that mm, I don't. Those are my top forty two running backs for fantasy football right now. I'm sure we'll do an updated version in August. But if you just want the rankings straight up into your eye holes. The best way to do that is by copping the draft guide, which will be live on August 1st. There is a pre-order discount price right now until August 1st on bdge.co. But as I've already yapped about, the least expensive way to get the draft guide is by going to Underdog Fantasy using promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more. They're going to hit you with a bunch of bonuses when you do that. A free square for week one, a .5 passing yards for Patrick Mahomes, I believe. And you'll get the draft guide emailed to you right before August 1st. Absolutely free. All right, back tomorrow with the wide receiver rankings. I will see you then. Smooches.